Good Sunday morning. I'd like to go through the announcements quickly, if possible. Everything's here in your bulletin. I will not bore you with all the details, but I'll skip over some of these, touch on some, skip on others. Uh, summer devotionals are still going on. Anyone interested, you can still jump in. It's uh, primarily virtual, but uh, the information is here. Open door, please don't forget. We have a tendency to forget that open door. Anything you want to donate, tissue, paper, food, anything downstairs here at the entrance sanctuary, please drop in the boxes there what you have and you can, uh, you can uh, contribute. Labor Day weekend is a big one. As you hopefully everybody knows, that's a one service uh, Sunday. And that, uh, by the way, the um, Steve Orr told me, share with me, we've got um, Gene Watson, who will be with us on that Sunday. So please enjoy, please come and enjoy uh, her beautiful ministry. Um, preschool, I'd like to just jump on that one. I don't know if Martha's around, but she's working pretty hard. Uh, actually, she's coming up with some very interesting things, reimagining things, trying to get more uh, interest in what's going on with the kids and the parents and trying to uh, move that forward. Uh, and let's not forget the Romeos and the Juliets because they're back in action. Uh, the big, big announcement is this one that's on the back of your bulletin. And it's even big enough for me to see. It's a special congregational meeting today. So immediately after today's service, we will have a meeting. And the purpose of that meeting is to get our pastor nominating committee organized and moving so that we can find ourselves a new pastor for our church. So that is for now all I have. Mark, uh, Margaret, please.
that was wonderful. For those who are able, please stand for the call of worship. From Psalm 24, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let the people now say, The flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the dogs. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us worship God. Please be seated. Let us all join in our corporate uh, prayer of confession. We pour out our hearts before you, O God. You are our refuge and strength. Waves of doubt beat against us, wakening our faith. Tremors of discord shake our foundation. The winds of temptation drive us from our course. Too often we rely on ourselves when wisdom sought the storms of our souls. Provide in Christ a haven of hope for our troubled and distracted fears. Please take a few minutes for your own individual prayer of confession.
Let us continue with our corporate prayer. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, grant us peace. Scripture declares that Christ is a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. He is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him. He lives to make intercession for all. In Christ, our high priest abides the assurance of the haven we seek. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. I am so excited to be here this morning. You have no idea because you are in for a treat. I want to read you something very, very quickly. It's an excerpt for the 150th Psalm, and then you'll know where I'm coming from. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him with trumpet and sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that is what we did this week at Praise Camp. Ladies and gentlemen, we praise the Lord. We praise the Lord with dance. We tried to praise the Lord with music, with making the, the pan pipes, but that has to be postponed till October. But we also praise God in his mighty firmament because if you look outside, art gallery of all the artwork that the children made. And we praise God in his mighty firmament when we painted aspen trees. We praise God in his mighty firmament when we painted beautiful parrots. We praise God again whenever we made and drew and painted the lilies of the field and also painted words of praise. And you'll also see a box out there that the children painted and that is a prayer box and they all received a little prayer toolkit for their prayer box. Now, with that, you are in for a treat because we also praise God with dance. Oh, did we dance. And I have the dancers and the artists here this morning in the church. So if I could have all the dancers plus anyone else, any other child who wants to dance, Lucas, come on up. Mackenzie, come on up. Any child in the church who wants to dance, come on up. And Miss Julie, could I have you stand right here? And can you help me line them up right here? Perfect. Vera, Antonio, are you ready? Caitlin, come line up right here. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, okay, here, let's stand up, okay? Let's stand right here. And you can watch Miss Julie, okay? Perfect. What is the, what's the dance move from again? The dance move. This is Julie Jeggy. She is a dance instructor from Amanda's Rhythm and Dance, and she was here all week to teach the children a dance, and they are going to dance and perform a song for you called My God. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do My God is so big and so strong and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do My God is so big and so strong and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do My God is so big and so strong and so mighty There's nothing my God Everything 
sinners, he still gave us worth. God sent his son to live here on the earth. He healed the sick, he made blind men see. He let the lame walk and he set the world free. He died on a cross and he rose from the grave. He conquered sin, he is mighty to save. If you went to heaven and he's coming back, God's word is true. But if it's attack, I'll look you in the eye and say, My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God Go back to your seat. Martha, that was fantastic. I think you woke us up. <laughs> Our scripture lesson comes from John's Gospel. It's a literary masterpiece, which contains the most important message for mankind ever. I guess you can tell I like John's gospel. Chapter 6, he's not too happy. Jesus is not too happy. And actually, I like to call this tough love. He's missing it. He's not getting back what he's given out. He's in a synagogue in Capernaum. It's a little fishing village, not far from Nazareth, where Jesus is starting to set up. And what Jesus really wants to know, especially about his 12, is are you in or are you out? Are you fishing or are you cutting bait? Please listen as I read John 6, verses 56, 69. Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? 
Then what? If you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father enables them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not to want, you do not to want leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Word of God for the people of God.
I'd like to thank the Chapel Bells for that beautiful uh, rendition of Be Thou My Vision, as well as uh, our liturgical dance before the gospel. I, when Martha called and, and uh, to fill me in, and I said, oh, I'm not too sure about liturgical dance. I realized she wasn't really giving me a choice. <laughs> I was only kidding about the, the liturgical dance, though. Today we finish our journey going through John's chapter 6 of Jesus and speaking of being the bread of life that comes down from heaven. I really appreciated the fact that the folks who put together the Revised Common Lectionary included the verses right above uh, that, we, that we first heard where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert and they died but whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will live forever. Then we go on to see that this was a hard teaching and Jesus' disciples were arguing about it. This isn't the first time we've seen arguments uh, happening over this teaching. After Jesus had fed the 5,000 with uh, five loaves of barley bread and two fish, people were following him I think mostly because it was a free meal and they had had their full and their bellies were nice and full. And Jesus moves on to talking about, about spiritual food and that's when the problems start. We read uh, previous weeks that there were arguments amongst themselves, amongst the disciples about what Jesus really meant by what he was saying and they're arguing today as well. I always find it interesting and that none of these disciples bothered to ask Jesus to explain a little bit more of what he was saying. They don't talk to him, they talk to each other and mostly we know what happens when that occurs. It just stirs the pot up. But we have to admit as we've been reading John's Gospel this, these last Sundays that this is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching for us to accept. It's a hard teaching for us to accept that the Son of God chose to become a human being like us in all things except sin, who freely chose to suffer and die for our sins so that we and all creation could be reconciled to the Father. We really might find it hard to believe this other thing we believe about the resurrection of the dead, that Jesus rose on the third day and that eventually he ascended into heaven and now sits at God's right hand. That's deep metaphoric spiritual language that we talk about because we're talking about things that are mysteries. 
not proven facts. They're things that we take on faith. Faith has been given to us, hopefully, by our parents or grandparents and passed on to us and nourished by our involvement in the Christian community. It's not an easy thing to accept these teachings, though. As I mentioned previously, the early Christians were accused of being cannibals. And uh, I will not torture you with the cannibal song from last week, uh, which, of course, we're not. We feast on the Lord and his risen body that comes to us in the forms of bread and wine. And though we believe that the bread and the wine remain bread and wine, there is something about Jesus' presence in them after the words of institution that nourishes our souls. As I shared with you previously, um, I was with Joslin Avenue for about 15 years. And uh, uh, the first 10 years of that, I would dutifully get up and uh, go to 7.30 Mass at St. Dan's. Now I had a really an alternative motive for this. Um, we share the lectionary pretty much with Catholics and Lutherans and Episcopalians. And uh, the priest we had at the time was a really good preacher. So I would go and basically take notes and on occasion raise my hand and say, excuse me, Father Chris, can you repeat that? Uh, he got transferred, and we got a pastor in who was not quite as good a preacher. And um, uh, for myself, I was to the point that I really had had it. Um, I, one Sunday in particular, I remember leaving church and just being very frustrated. And I came to Joslin, and we had worship, and we had communion. And I will never forget the feeling of the Lord's presence in my heart and in our midst at that time and the comfort and consolation that I received. And I hope the other members of the con congregation experienced that as well. A hard teaching to accept, but we accept it on faith. Peter has this beautiful statement towards the end of today's gospel passage. And I love the line, Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. We've come to believe. I'm convinced that he was moved by the Holy Spirit to make that profession of faith. I don't think he deduced it or figured it out on his own, but he was able to take a step out in faith and believe what Jesus was saying. Not that he had a hundred... 80 degree complete turnaround or 360 turnaround conversion. We know that he stumbled and bumbled during the rest of the Gospels, including betraying Jesus um, during Jesus' trial. And yet he took a step out of faith to believe. And we know further that after Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter preached the good news, the Gospel and eventually was martyred in Rome. So that's pretty good for somebody who doesn't always get it right. It gives us courage as well and consolation when we don't quite get it right. And there's a good reason why we always have a prayer of confession before we be really begin our worship as it reminds us that we always come before God as sinners in need of his forgiving grace. One year, we had, Christmas fell on a Tuesday, and we were, so we were having our Christmas Eve service on Monday. And because the Jocelyn community was rather elderly, we had Christmas service at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because we weren't allowed to drive at night. <laughs> and so I was preparing the bulletin with the woman, she of the doc, Dutch accent that I've mentioned previously. And I made some comment about, well, you know, we just had the prayer of confession yesterday. I don't think we really need to do it again today. And she was like, what? What are you saying? Don't you know we're always sinners? And I'm like, yeah, but it's like hardly even been like 24 hours. <laughs> really, 
what could you do? And she said, well, I got up this morning, I looked outside and it snowed, and my neighbor was throwing his snow on my grass and I was not happy. So she felt that she had sinned. So we put it in. But it reminds me again and again that we always come before, uh, before God as sinners and that our salvation is a gift. John never asks us to do works of mercy uh, no matter what they are. Uh, there's no beatitudes in his gospel. I don't think there's a Jesus come in glory judging at the end. He asks us instead to believe to believe what Jesus taught us about himself, that he gave his very self for us so that we could be one with God. He wants us to believe, and more than that, as we reflected last week, especially as we looked at the icon of the Trinity, and most of you took a card home for your own prayer, and that God invites us to share in his eternal life. Those three figures are on three sides of the table, and the fourth side is left open for us so that we may sit down and share in eternal life. My brothers and sisters, this is what we are made for. This is what we are made for. We have a taste of that eternal life here, and this is not pie in the sky when you die, and this is just seeing things more fully or completely. This is trying to see things with God's eyes. I've never been one for those who say, oh, you know, you're suffering, you're just suffering, go ahead, because in heaven God's going to make it better. That's a lot of nonsense. We are called to, first of all, have our hearts transformed by God's love, and then to be a transformative presence in our church, in our community, and in our world, so it doesn't end with us. But we are called above all, before we do any of those things, to abide in God so that God can abide, abide in us so that we can have life and have it to the full. I love Peter's confession where he says, we have come to believe that not only are you the son, the son of God or the most high of God, and not only do we don't know where else to go, but he says, you have the words of eternal life. Jesus gives us the words to eternal life. Jesus is the one who gives us nourishment for our journey towards eternal life. We often have lots of hungers in our world. We have hungers in our lives. The need to always be right. The need to be in control the need to do things perfectly, uh, and the need to, as my sister would say, be in charge. And those are just my little kingdoms. I'm, I'm sure you probably have your own that are different. But Peter reminds us that those kingdoms and those little dominions that we have built up for ourselves are fading and passing away. And only Jesus and his word is the key to eternal life. I know you all have the Westminster Catechism and a couple other catechisms, and, and not to be outdone, uh, when I was in Catholic grade school, we had the Baltimore Catechism, and there were about 160 questions in it. Now, the first one was, who made you? And the answer was, God made me. Second question was, why did God make you? The answer is, God made me to know him and love him and serve him in this world and to be happy in the next. Now, let me tell you, there's 158 other questions, none of which I remember. <laughs> but these two are carved in my heart because above all else, it is that God made us because God loves us and calls us to love and serve him in this world and to be happy with him in the next. Our challenge is to open our hearts, to open our spirits, to open our lives to his presence, to allow the Lord to come in and 
Give us hearts of flesh instead of hearts of stone. Give us the grace to let go of our little kingdoms and dominions and be about building up his kingdom and his rule. The wonderful thing is that God always beckons us, even when we have our back turned to him. I know there's some theologians, especially in the early Reformation, that believed in the complete depravity of the human being, and they may be right, but I'm one of those who thinks that even when we were lost and, and, um, and depraved, that there was still a, a honing beam within us of God's light and love that attracted God to us again so that we could have redemption and eternal life. We don't have to get it right this Sunday. We don't have to get this belief right next Sunday or the Sundays after. But we are called to open ourselves to that transforming grace. I have a very lovely lady in our hospice service right now, and fortunately, she's still able to uh, get up and go to church, so she decided she would save my torturous vigils until she was... Uh, locked in her house. <laughs> and I was talking with her, and she said, you know, several years ago, I felt God tapped me on the shoulder, and I thought, this time I have to respond. So he tapped me on the shoulder lots of times before to pay attention, and I was too busy with other things. And this was even before her cancer diagnosis or uh, terminal status and being on hospice care. And she amazed me because of the depth of her spirituality, the depth of her relationship with God, her faith and her trust in God, and that she was at peace where she was in her life. God continually taps us on the shoulder and invites us to pay attention. God continually calls us to God's self. God never turns his back on us, even if we turn our back on him. He has sent his son so that we may have life and have it to the full. He has sent his son so that we may have nourishment and support and be fed on our journey here until the day comes when we sit down at the banquet in heaven where every tear will be wiped away and all things will be made well. One more really quick little story. I might have shared this before, and if I did, oh well. Uh, <laughs> I was working as a full, uh, doing my work as a chaplain and uh, went to see uh, the daughter of a patient who was in a, a nursing home down in Livonia, like Livonia, like Middle Belt, and, I-96, and so, you know, I live in Clarkston, and, well, okay, and uh, then she says, well, I work, so I can't be there till 5.30, and I said, well, okay, and the reality is I'm usually done with my work by 3.30, quarter to 4, and I go to the gym and come home and make supper and relax. I said, well, all right, I'll come down and meet you there. So it's the middle of January, and of course, it's pitch black outside a quarter after five. And it's slushy, and it's cold, and it's snowing, and everything else. And I am not what you would say a happy camper. But I said I would be there. So I went, and we had a really nice visit. As I was talking with the patient's daughter, the patient herself was um, pretty much asleep and unresponsive. So I, 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 you know, asked about mom's life and this, then, the other thing, and, you know, then I asked the question, uh, well, who's waiting for her in heaven? I, I said, uh, you know, is your dad in heaven waiting for your mom? And she says, oh, yeah, he died, but they had a really bad divorce years ago. And I said, being the smart aleck that I am, oh, well, maybe there's somebody else waiting for her and she looked at me and she said what kind of hospice chaplain are you <laughs> up until that moment i thought oh a pretty damn good one <laughs> i've been doing this for 20 years like what's your problem and she she looked at me and she said 
Don't you know that in heaven, all things are healed and made well? And she cut me to the quick. She was absolutely right. That's our destiny. To be healed and may be made whole, to share in God's life fully. I encourage you this week to pray for the grace to allow God's transformative presence to come into your lives and have the grace to cooperate with it. Also to have the grace not to give up. We are a work in progress until our dying breath and maybe even a little bit after that. But we don't give up. We continue to persevere. And we do because we know that God is with us, God loves us, and God wants us to have eternal life. Amen. give thanks to the Lord our God for it is truly right to give him our thanks and praise and we pray God we praise you we gather together to worship you to remember the goodness and unfailing love you have shown toward us your people time after time you have come to our rescue your love has sustained us through good times and bad no matter what we faced whether accident, illness, disappointment, or death, 
you were there encouraging, strengthening, and blessing. Even when we turned our back on you, you did not abandon us, but waited patiently for us to return, ready to welcome us with open arms. Because we have known your love in the past, we look to the days ahead without fear. No matter how uncertain the future may seem, we will continue to trust in your unfailing love, confident that you will guide us in the days ahead as you have guided us in the past. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. I, uh, I shared with the folks at 8.30, uh, our worship service at 8.30, that I usually spend some time scouring the web looking for good pastoral prayers uh, to use. And uh, to be honest, uh, eh, not a whole lot to choose from. <laughs> so I'm uh, trusting that the Holy Spirit come down upon us. Let my brothers and sisters, let us join our hearts, our minds, our spirits in prayer. Gracious and loving God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We come before you today with so many worries and concerns, so much that is happening around us. We pray that you draw near to us with your peace. We pray that you bring your pe uh, healing grace to those we hold up in prayer. We pray that your spirit strengthen all those who are about doing your work. So we pray, Lord, today for the church throughout the world. We pray that you heal the divisions that exist in the body of Christ. That you bless the work of those who teach and preach, those who care for the sick, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, for those who are about doing the work of your kingdom. Bless their work, help it to bear fruit. Today, Lord, and these days as we read the newspaper and watch the news on TV or on the computer, we hold up the people of Afghanistan to you for those who are longing for someone to come and rescue them, for those who are in fear, for those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. We pray today also for the Taliban, that you touch their hard hearts. We ask that you touch them so that they no longer use religion as an excuse for war and power. We ask that your blessings come down upon all those who are working to bring people out of Kabul and bring them home to safety. Lord, we hold up in prayer all those who are suffering because of natural disasters. And sometimes I'm not even sure, Lord, if we can rem remember them all. The people of Haiti, not only an earthquake, but now torrential rain. A hurricane that's going to be bearing down on New Jersey and New York and parts of the United States. Other hurricanes and tropical storms. Pray for those who are suffering because of wildfires and drought. We pray for those uh, for whom uh, nature is a challenge. We ask you to pour your healing grace upon the earth. And we ask you as well that you give us grace to uh, be good stewards of the creation you have entrusted to us. We continue to hold up in prayer our country, our elected and appointed officials. We pray that you heal the division that is so apparent in our nation these days. We ask that you raise up wise leaders who have a concern for the common good and are willing to serve the public more than their party. 
We pray for this congregation gathered in your name, for an outpouring of your spirit today as they elect their nominating committee. We pray for uh, wise choices and good insights, a spirit of collegiality and a spirit of working together. You have blessed us this summer with these months to be with you in your presence, and now we ask that your grace be at work with us in a special way. And we pray for all those who are sick and suffering, especially those of this congregation, for those of us who struggle with accepting our diminishment, for those in chronic pain, for those for whom death comes too quickly, and for those for whom death does not come fast enough. We pray for all the sick that are in our bulletin and that are in our hearts, and we ask that your healing grace come down upon them. Lord, you know the thought, oops, almost forgot. We pray for Sandy. We asked for prayers earlier at this morning's worship. Uh, for Jimmy Bra Br Brady, uh, both uh, uh, end-stage cancer, and Jean Rick, who was hospitalized briefly this week. So we hold our sick in our hearts and present them before the Lord. And now, confident, we pray in the words that Jesus himself has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
let's bow our heads and pray for God's blessings. May the love of God, oh, may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ draw us to him. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And may the blessings of Almighty God, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon us and remain with us forever. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to have a seat as we listen to the uh, postlude, and then I believe we'll be starting the congregation meeting right after that, and I'm going to sort of waddle out after the postlude. <laughs>